Welcome to Brewing TV. I'm your host, Jake Keeler. Michael Dawson is on assignment today, so he'll be rocking it with me solo. We're here on a rainy day in my garage, and we're gonna be brewing up a five gallon extract batch of caribou slobber from Northern Brewer. But before we get to that, I need your help, BTV viewers. So come with me. Come on, don't be shy. Thanks for joining me guys. Here's where I need your help. I've got a ton of equipment. I've got everything I need for all grain brewing, extract brewing, kegging, fermenting, crushing my own grain, keeping things in storage, and I've got the space to do it. Um, along the way of being a home brewer for X amount of years and working in the industry, I've picked up quite a few pieces of equipment. Some of the stuff I definitely am going to use. Some of the stuff like a 15 gallon stainless steel kettle, I might not use that often. The situation I'm in is a situation that a lot of people get into when they enter into this hobby. How do you use the space that you have? I used to live in apartments and duplexes. I always just made do with the space that was available. My wife and I bought this house about a year and a half ago and now I have much more space, I have more time and I have more resources to invest in it to create the home brewery that I want. I saw a talk by John Blickman at this year's NHC and it was on the topic of creating your own home brewery. And the two major things I took away from that talk were this. One, have a plan. Draw up some sketches, take inventory on the equipment that you have, know what it is that you're dealing with. Two, know what you want to brew, have a goal in mind. So with that in mind, I know the space I have, I know the equipment I have, I can draw up some plans. We can get started that way. And two, I know the beers that I want to brew. I want to brew ales and lagers, of course, uh, but mostly session beers. Um, dark lagers, Vienna lagers in the colder months when I can ferment at ambient temperatures here in the basement, being that I live in Minnesota. Uh, the rest of the time mostly do ales, uh, but five gallon batches, uh, mostly all grain, and I want to be able to uh, ferment them at ambient temperatures within my basement. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at the spaces that I have, and I'm going to pose the question to you guys to get some feedback on where to get started. All right. Let's get going. Well, the first thing we need to start with is where does our water come from, right? Because that's, that's one of the major things about a brew day is where you're going to collect your water, where you're going to do your cleaning, where you're going to do your sanitizing, and probably where you're going to do your chilling, whether you're doing an ice bath, immersion chilling, or plate chilling. Um, so let's take you into that area first. This part of the basement right here is the laundry room. And in the laundry room, of course, we've got a washer and a dryer. Uh, we've got a basin sink here. Now this house came with a double basin sink, plastic. I had to replace that as our water main got replaced shortly after we moved in. And so they had to put this new water main in here, which meant I had to get a new sink. Um, this is where I collect all of my water for brewing. It's where I do all my sanitizing. It's where I do all my cleaning. And it's where I do my chilling. And with that eight gallon mega pot, I can fit that inside here, surround it with ice, hook up a immersion chiller, and get my temps down pretty quickly. Now, if I'm going to do something bigger, like that 15 gallon uh, uh, kettle that I showed you earlier, we may need to run a hose from here out to the garage um, to chill instead of using this. Uh, it's a step I haven't taken yet, and that's something I'd like to put out there. You know, how many of you have piped out to your uh, garage water? You know, in some states, that's a realistic possibility, say if you live in the southern part of the states where the temperatures don't go below freezing. But in Minnesota, Putting a, a pipe out in my garage might not be the, the smartest thing. Um, so that's where that occurs. All the cleaning, the chilling, the sanitizing works pretty well. Uh, you make do with the space you have. At some point, we'll gut this place and remodel. But for now, this works pretty well. Over here is a spare bathroom uh, with a shower stall, which we don't use for taking showers. Uh, but it works really well when I need to dry off things that I've cleaned or sanitized. Um, it makes it really easy to keep those things out of the way. Um, it's got a drain in the floor so I can set things down that can drain down. It uh, doesn't collect and it works pretty well for that fashion. It can also be used as a fermentation area. I can keep it dark in here. The temperature stays at a pretty good uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 degrees in the winter time, which is pretty good. 
Um, but other than that, this is the, uh, the water collection area, the cleaning area, the sanitizing area, and the chilling area. But before we move on, we should probably check in on that brew. I think we're going to hit a boil here pretty soon. we got to add that first edition of hops. All right, we got our first edition here for the full 60 minutes of the boil. we got some U.S. Goldings, alpha acid 4.5, so not a lot of bittering, but this is going to be our bittering hop. Should give it a nice little hoppy backbone to this brown ale. So here we go. Blow. Turn the heat down slightly uh, to prevent the risk of a boil over, but looks like they're taking pretty well, so knock that up a little bit. All right, we've got this boil under control. It looks like we can leave for a little bit. I uh, just want to make sure that this isn't going to cause a boil over, and I think we're good to go. We need to get back to the tour of my home brewery. Um, at about the 45 minute mark, we're going to have to add that other addition of hops, so we'll come back out here when we hit that mark. All right, next up, we've got a fermentation chamber. Now, this little baby came with the house. It's a bump out in the foundation that they turned into a closet and must have used as a cellar at some point. This house is over 100 years old, so um, I'm sure this has been used for several different things in those long, long years. Uh, what I've been using it for is for fermenting and conditioning. Right now, I've got uh, six gallons of wine in there, Italian Primitivo, so the, the, the high 70s at where it's at right now are fine for that. Um, just about two weeks ago, I fermented a India brown ale and uh, I was concerned because the upper levels of the yeast were around 72, 73 degrees and it was 72 degrees in the chamber so I knew if I pitched some yeast that would take it over that, that, uh, that temperature range and I would get some off flavors. So what I did is I put my cooler in here with a bunch of ice just like I have right now. That brought the, the, uh, the ambient temperature of this entire chamber down to about 68 degrees which was perfect for that particular beer. And since we're doing a brown ale, using a very similar yeast on this one, uh, the Y's 1332, um, this should get it down to the level where I need it, which is in maybe the mid to high 60s to pitch the yeast. Um, the ice stays there for through the, the main days of the fermentation. Obviously my cat likes it in here as well. <laughs> um, but what I would like to do ultimately with this chamber is use it uh, with ambient temperatures, maybe some correction in the summer with some ice, but in the winter, this gets into the uh, upper 30s and lower 40s, so it's perfect for lagering. So what I'd like to see in here is build something, sits on the floor, comes up, one shelf, carboys, maybe half a dozen, a second tier, and then we've got kegs. So I've got just about enough room here, I think it's about 80 inches tall, uh, where we can get kegs up top, carboys on the bottom, ferment, condition in this entire space, really put it to use, because right now, I can put carboys on the bottom, I can put kegs on the bottom, but obviously this space is totally unused. Um, you know, ambient temperatures in the summer, I can bring it down to that 68, 70 degrees, even with 90 degrees outside. In the winter time, we're looking at mid 30s to mid 40s, perfect for lagering. So this chamber should allow me to ferment the beers that I want to ferment uh, based on seasonality. Um, but looking at this space, it's kind of hard for me to conceive of how I'm going to do this. I'm a visual thinker, so let me draw you a picture. So what we got here, the chamber is about 80 inches high across the whole thing. It's about 40 inches deep from the door to the, to the back wall. And it's 42 and 65 inches wide, respectively. That lower parts 42 and then the foundation kind of bumps out again and it's 65 up top which is sort of the 65 is irrelevant it really doesn't matter so we're really operating with 42 inches so we're looking at a chamber here this is the door here people Brrr, swings open oh. and uh there's a small ledge here and a small ledge here Effectively, this distance right here is about 42, this is about 40, and this is about 80. So now I've got a basic diagram. What I'm talking about is building a shelf here all the way back on studs, all four corners, more studs right here, and another shelf. Um, so from the front, it's going to look like this. 
have a carboy and a carboy, then possibly another shelf up here. Or we could actually, now looking at this, we don't really even need that. We only need one shelf because we can just put the kegs up top. As long as this is strong enough, um, it should be able to support the kegs. And that's the key, I think. The key is how strong does this need to be? How many braces does it need? Um, looking at this now and thinking about it, uh, you know, if I want to get six five gallon kegs up there full of liquid, uh, this is going to have to be a pretty strong structure above those carboys. So I may need to go with uh, six legs and probably something uh, maybe even a, an inch thick piece of uh, maybe like birch plywood or something that a little bit stronger. Um, probably use uh, metal brackets uh, connecting the studs to the plywood to give it some more stability. I think that, that that structure, it doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to look good. It's going to sit inside the fermentation chamber, but it's kind of got to be that diesel strength, you know. So as you can see, it's just a quick rough sketch. I'm not going to be submitting this to an architect anytime soon. But that's not what you need. What you need is you just need to kind of draw things out and to plan in your head. And sometimes just putting it visually, drawing it out, looking at it helps you make some decisions and get past some snafus. Like me thinking I needed a second shelf when actually I only need one platform here to rest the kegs on. So we've got our dimensions, we've got our sketch. I think I just heard that 45 minute mark on my timer. So we should get back out there for the second hop edition. All right, we've got some Liberty hops here, 3.4 alpha acid. We've hit it on the uh, 45 minute mark, so we're ready to add this. Turn the heat down just slightly. We still got a boil going, but again, you want to protect against boil over. So here we go. Throw those bad boys in there. One thing I really like about this, uh, this recipe, and this is the second time that I've made it, uh, it's an American brown ale, and it's got all the maltiness that you're looking for, um, but that hop balance in this particular beer is, is really good. There's just enough hop balance there to have some hoppiness in a brown ale, but it's not overpowering. It does let the brown ale kind of um, profile the malty character a little bit more. Um, this is a clone of Moose Drool from Big Sky Brewing Company. And uh, I think it's pretty close to the original and it is definitely one of my favorite session beers. Next up, we've got my uh, chest freezer, which I just recently purchased. It was uh, just over $100, not too much. Uh, and actually doing some research, these are, these are fairly energy efficient to run. They don't cost a lot of money, especially if you're going to be running it at refrigeration temperatures as opposed to freezing. So uh, it really only runs occasionally to keep it at about 42, 43 degrees. Now how that's achieved is I've got a Johnson Digital Temperature Controller right here. And this sends a, uh, a thermometer probe down into the unit to, to gauge the temperature. Um, and then you plug the, the chest freezer into this, and then you plug this into the wall. So this basically controls the uh, electrical current to the chest freezer to turn it on and off to regulate the temperature. So it only really runs occasionally um, to maintain that 42, 43 degree uh, temperature. So really easy way to keep either your serving beer cold, or if you're uh, trying to do like lager fermentation in the summer, these are good ways to achieve that. And obviously you can find a used chest freezer for pretty cheap nowadays. Uh, so we open this thing up. Yeah, it's looking pretty dismal. Uh, I've only got one keg on tap right now. Uh, and all this brewing and talking about brewing is getting me pretty thirsty. So I'm gonna grab me a little bit of my brewing to you taster glass. Um, what you'll notice here is I've got my keg in here. I've got a picnic tap hooked up. Um, I've got my CO2 tank down here. Uh, this all fits in here comfortably. Obviously I can get about three kegs in here into this nine cubic foot uh, chest freezer. I can get the tank in here. Comes with a little tray. I keep my eyes and glass, my, my yeast in here. That's pretty handy to have it near the brew area. I can keep bottles of things I want to serve. Uh, 
But what you, you usually see with something like this, where it's a serving, uh, a serving vessel, if you're converting one of these chest freezers, is a skirt, uh, turning it into a kegerator of sorts in a, with tap handles. So usually what you do is you build a skirt around the edge here, out of wood. You can use, you can use uh, any kind of grade wood, or you can use nice wood, you know, from cheap to a little more expensive. You build a skirt to bring the lid off. You take the lid off, and the back is just hinges, really simple, in and out. You attach those hinges to the skirt, um, and you basically just uh, build that around here, and you can get some rubber sealant uh, here. You can lay that down as well to get a better seal, uh, but essentially you just raise this up a little bit, and then through that skirt, that wood, you drill the holes, you get the shanks, and you put the tap handles on the outside, maybe with a drip tray. And then what you do is you run tap lines from your kegs as opposed to picnic lines into those tap uh, those shanks and to the tap handles on the outside. And that is the uh, the goal here. So if people, if you have suggestions about how I should go about doing that, if you have some do's, some don'ts, some tips and tricks in that regard, I'd love to hear them because I'd love to have this finished before the end of the summer. And I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, we're about ready for that last hop addition at the 15 mark. We're going to add some Wurflac for, uh, for congealing effect. And uh, yeah, I think it's time to get back to the kettle. All right, we're 15 minutes away from the end of the boil. So we're going to add our uh, aroma hop, a uh, Willamette alpha acid 4.7. I'm going to throw that in right now. See, we've got a nice vigorous boil going. Stir that in. The last area of concern is this two car garage that I have. Right now, this is where I do most of my brewing, but as you can see, it's full of stuff and it's quickly becoming a storage unit. I need ideas on how to convert this into a better brew area, so I would like to see pictures of your badass brew houses. Send me suggestions, send me pictures. Send me ideas, please save me. You can do that by sending us an email at brewingtv at northernbrewer.com. You can also leave a comment under this episode page, or if you like us on Facebook, you can leave a comment there. We're just about done with this boil. We got a few minutes left. Uh, when we get that done, we're gonna chill it down, pitch the yeast, put it in that fermentation chamber we showed you, and say goodnight to it. Well. I hope you guys have a great brew day the next time you get a chance to brew some beer. All for brew, brew for all. Team Brewing TV, here we go. We're right here, Minnesota, boom. We need to get to Wisconsin, boom. New Glarus, Hop Farm, Brew Pubs. These are the objectives. We need to drive, boom, to there. Four hours, beers, cheese, Sci-fi movies. That means aliens with ray guns. Beep, 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 beep. Any questions?